Howdy doody folks. Apologise for the lateness of my starting. So, um, I did do a little list of things to talk about. And one particular thing I wanted to cover, news-wise. Um, I made some notes. Let me just open those up. Oh, I need a browser as well. Bear with me a sec. Let's just get the browser up. So, how has everyone been this week? Let me know who's here. Um, let me just double check. News. Let's just quickly talk. I don't want to cover a lot of different subjects in news. There's one big one I want to talk about. Um, whether we get to do the other things or not depends on how long this goes. But this is really interesting. Um, let me just check other pieces. Right, so what I'd like to talk about, I mean, there's a few things I want to cover about what I've been working on this week. So I've got one particular, I've got a new um, product that I want to make, which is more application specific, which is interesting. Um, I've also got to deal with wireless communications. I've got a little bit of a conundrum with that, so I'd appreciate some feedback. But before we do that, so the community news, uh, let me just switch. Um, this is more generic news, but it's very interesting, um, partially because um, of some of the work I've done in the past. Let me just bring up my browser so we can see it. Uh, 
Uh, why is that not showing? Hold on. it up. <sighs> so I'd like to talk about this. Hmm. Size a bit awkward here. So um I think it was was it yesterday they announced this or was it the day before? Raspberry Pi have announced um, a new product that's very interesting. Um, I'm guessing that you guys already know about it. But um, let's see. So, I mean, the, the new product that they're talking about... Um, it's called the Raspberry Pi Pico. Let me get a good picture of it up. Hold on. Close up. There you go. So it's really um, hi Laurie, by the way. Um, it's very actually very interesting from a couple of different points of view, and I'll get into that in a bit. Um, so basically what they've announced is this this board here, um, the Raspberry Pi Pico, which is really a movement from where they've been. If you think about most of the Raspberry Pi stuff, that's centered around um, embedded Linux um, and Raspberry and based around their, the uh, Broadcom SOC. So this is a real departure from that um, because the Raspberry Pi Pico is really um, a microcontroller board. So if you think in terms of things like feather boards, teensies, you know, Arduino Nanos, this is in that class, which is a very interesting, um, interesting move. And there's a lot more to the move, I think, that's which is why I'm interested, as well as what's on this board. Um, if anyone remembers the history, um, Ebden, when he was originally designing boards, he was designing microcontroller-based boards. And he thought that that was the way that he was going to go. And then later on, got the opportunity to do the... Uh, Broadcom SOC based uh, chip and ended up going down the Linux route. So I, in one way I can see him fulfilling some of his original um, concepts in many ways. You know, at that time there weren't as many um, players in this, this market, for example. We had Arduino among others. So what's actually on this board um, is a microcontroller, but it's not any old microcontroller. And this is where it gets very interesting. Um, let me just change this slightly because I'm uh, getting my head locked off a tad. Um, Laurie Griffiths says it's very cheap. You're right. I mean, it's uh, it's a four dollar board, which is highly inexpensive. This is in the kind of price ranges of um, I'm trying to think of the name of it, the uh, the kind of blue pill or whatever that you normally find on an STM32, you know, made board made in China. Um, in the UK, it's three pounds fifty. So it's exceptionally low cost. Um, 
And if you just, just look at this board and you just think, oh, it's a microcontroller on the board, you know, what's new about that? Because so many people have already done this, right? But it's not because the actual chip on this board has been designed by the folks at Raspberry Pi themselves. They've been working on this silicon since 2016, effectively. So this is the culmination of four years' work for them. Um, and I've been looking at some of the comments and feedback, and Ebden's answered a number of questions around this. Um, and one of the things that he said, which is very interesting, is they knew early on if they were going to do this, and apparently they spent a great deal of money on this, let alone the amount of time they put in. And believe you me, it, it's, to do this is not, not inexpensive. It's very costly to build a chip. Um, but they wanted to do something very different. And what they've got is quite different. And I, I want to talk about some of that because it's important. But the point being is they haven't gone away, you know, and picked up an ARM STM32 or a microchip pick or, a, you know, an NXP or, you know, a Renesis microcontroller or something like that. You know, this is their own design. Um, very few organizations would go to that kind of effort. So in itself, it's extraordinary. And I think it's a very, very interesting and possibly a very smart move. Um, and Ebden's point about if they were going to do this, they were going to have to do something different. Ebden's fairly smart in the marketplace. He's He's got a bit of cunning about him in terms of direction and stuff. Um, and he knows that in order to do this, they'd have to pull off something, you know, something quite diff different from what everyone else is doing. Um, ra the Raspberry Pi organization themselves were in a very, very opportune position, I think. They have a very large um, community of developers. They've also got a very high volume. So when they come to produce something, they can leverage that volume. That puts them in a very good position if they play, uh, you know, a canny game, to use a northern term. Uh, and I think this is a canny move. Um, if anyone else was to do this, you know, if someone like Google did it, it would probably fail miserably. Um, but with that group of developers, that community of developers, and the volume, that combination um, could really be a powerful combination if taken in the right direction. So some of the things they're doing with this that I want to talk about today um, from a hardware point of view um, are very interesting for a number of reasons. And it's a great deal of interest to me because um, I've seen some of this and worked with some of this in the past before. However, very few people have been successful in moving certain dials, um, particularly in development. Development is very, very focused around some fairly narrow um, 
ways of organizing um, code and things, you know, whether that be languages like C, for example. You know, this is C in the embedded world is it's stuck in there like glue, you know, there's no way it's going away. Um, yes, we have the new the rise of Python in some of these areas, which is quite interesting. There's also Rust in the background as well. I'm not going to talk about Rust today, but uh, the Python stuff is definitely emergent and an important factor. So first off, let's let's just talk about the support. So they've got a complete software development kit for um, for this uh, for this board, the Pico board. Um, they have also included, um, before we talk about the hardware, they've also included MicroPython, which I think is super smart. Now, obviously, a lot of their, certainly their educational development uh, community is uses a lot of um, Python, as well as obviously C. Just bear with me a sec, I've just got to get rid of this dialogue column. So, um, putting MicroPython on there is a really good idea. Now, putting MicroPython on any microcontroller is actually pretty tricky because there's certain things that you need, um, and one of those is memory. Memory is a real problem. Because um, normally what it means is... If you want to run MicroPython on a microcontroller, it's going to cost you a lot more than that microcontroller will normally be because you can only use the ones that have the larger amounts of memory. Because obviously when you're using Python, uh, the memory requirements are quite large in two areas. One is the code base. There's a lot of library stuff. Even though it's written in C and compiled, it still takes up a lot of room. So the base libraries you need are pretty big. So you normally need as a minimum, you know, 256K of ROM, flash, or RAM if you don't have any ROM. Then you need the runtime RAM, and that can get pretty big. Um, in Python, you've got a lot of strings and things like that. It's not the most efficient language. It does do some things in there's some clever stuff done in MicroPython to try and reduce down things like constant strings and stuff and the way that those are managed. But it still takes quite a lot of RAM compared to, you know, your normal C-type programming. Um, and, they, and they're supporting that out of the box. So if we start looking at some of these uh, specifications, um, they have 264 kilobytes of on-chip RAM, which is very generous. Um, and you kind of need as much as you can get when you're running MicroPython. They don't include any significant um, read-only memory. I think there's a small amount in, internally, but it's not useful. It's just basic bootloader stuff in there. The what they do is they expose quad SPI pins, which is basically clock CS and then uh, four data signals that enable you to connect in an external SPI flash chip, for example, to use for ROM. That way you get to choose how much you want. But obviously these are very low cost now, these flash chips. So hooking them in, um, at a board level is a very economical way of doing it and it gives you lots of flexibility right so that's pretty smart not only that um, doing that on its own is not good enough when you're using something external like QSPI flash or QSPI RAM then you have to have a decent cache um, inside the processor because if you don't have that you get a lot of repetitive accesses over the slower external QSPI bus. Having the cache there means it can look ahead and bring in the bits that it needs. Uh, so that's pretty important. And if that's done efficiently, then you can get fairly good performance from this external flash. 
By the way, they're also formatting that using UFS2 or whatever it is, which is this uh, partitioned format, which is a common bootloader format, which is really handy. So that's very clever of them to do that. Now, in terms of what they're using inside for processing, they've gone a rather strange route here. Um, they've gone for the um, ARM Cortex M0 Plus, I, the second generation of the ARM Cortex M0. Um, and they're using dual cores. So they're using two M0s, dual core. And they're running them at a very high rate. If you see most of the M0s out there, they tend to run at kind of 48 um, megahertz is, is a common frequency for these, you know, around the 50 megahertz mark. But they're ramping these up at 133 megahertz, which is interesting. You know, the M0 Plus was designed to be a very low transistor count, low power consumption core. So it cuts out a lot of the other stuff. So um, it doesn't have any of the floating point stuff. Okay. Um, so anything numerical that requires floating point is running soft FPU stuff. However, they haven't just got a single M0 in there. They've actually got a dual M0. So they've got two M0s running 133 megahertz. It's 32-bit core as well, by the way. So this is an interesting combination and an interesting choice. Now, they've obviously gone for something here to keep the transistor count down low and the power consumption low. They've obviously done some calculations about where they think this is going to be used and with what sort of things this is going to be used. They've obviously deprioritized anything like floating point performance here and prior to prioritized all the other instructions and the other types. So this is integer based performance with maybe some uh, fixed size instructions, fixed size uh, math. They don't have any of the DSP instructions, for example, that you find in the higher end ARM Cortex. So that's quite an interesting choice. And far be it from me to um, comment exactly on where they see that. They, they've got a good idea where they're aiming this at. It's a 40 nanometer process as well that they've used, which is pretty good. Um, it's got DMA controllers. And it's got 30 GPIOs on this particular board, uh, four of which are analog inputs. It's got a couple of UARTs, SPIs, and I2C controllers. Circle back around to that in a bit. It's got PWM channels, 60. If you do PWM on any of the GPIOs, it's got a very good um muxed arrangement on the bus so you can run these on any pins more or less it's also got usb 1.1 which is kind of essential for programming it among other things uh, apparently that supports host and device um, and it's got the pios and i'm going to circle back round to that because that's really one of the very interesting parts of this and I'll explain why in a minute as I say here USB mass storage boot mode with UF2 support for drag and drop program so when you plug it in when you get your Pi it comes up as a drive and you can put whatever you want on there whether that's MicroPython or C code or whatever which is kind of cool but it's funny they've gone with MicroPython here they haven't gone with CircuitPython so before we dig into any details, and the details are really interesting, by the way, but let's just step back from this. Okay, so that's what they've done with this board. There's very little else on the board, so there's no Wi-Fi or any of that kind of wireless connectivity. It really is a straightforward microcontroller board from that respect. But guess what? They're not just making a board here. 
they've made the silicon to go in that board but they are selling the silicon as well now you're not going to go and find this at your distributors yet i don't think they've got the stock but already we know pi moroni have two boards that they're planning they have a smaller one uh, let me show you this um, Do, do, do. There's two different things that they're working on here. This one is coming soon. So this is a tiny little board, again with the same, what they call it is the RP2040. That's, that's kind of the part code from Raspberry Pi for this particular chip. So what's clear here is this is not just the board that the Raspberry Pi organization have done. They have made a move here into silicon. They've become a UK semiconductor company, which I find fascinating at this point in time. There's very few of those, um, despite ARM being here. Um, the other one that comes to mind is Exmos, and I'll link back to that in a bit. In fact, there are some directors that are part of ARM and part of Exmos um and probably you know in touch with raspberry pi as well the organization i don't know who's on the board at the raspberry pi org at the moment but i wouldn't be surprised to see some others in there um so yes here's pi moroni and they're talking about making their uh, tiny 2040 that's number one um similar features what they've added on here i think is a usb-c connector rather than a regular usb connector that you find on the uh, raspberry pi pico um and they they use a larger qspi flash chip again having that qspi externally so that you can do that yourself is you can actually choose what size so they're using a larger one eight megabytes of qspi um Got some RGBs. Um, that's about it. Oh, the other thing that, that the chip has is it has a switch mode uh, regulator in it as well. So it can actually be driven by a whole range of voltages, which is quite interesting. Um, you don't often see that in microcontrollers. So that's one. Um, I wonder if we can find the other one that they're planning on. I've seen it on Twitter. Do they have it on here? The other thing they're doing is... Uh, um like a wireless uh board um oh they've got this pico system which is interesting so this is an all, all in one gaming system based around the chip it's one product as well it's another product so they they will be porting all the retro games and stuff a lot of those those as well as new games which is interesting um and there's a lot of retro interest in this and there's another board oh, I, just, uh, I wonder if i can find it uh, let me see Hmm. Hold on, let me just change my keyboard. It always switches back. Hmm. Come on. If I look at Phil, who works at Pi Moroni, maybe he's already treated this, actually. I don't know. I haven't been paying attention. They've already done a whole bunch of peripherals as well for the board, as you'd imagine. Um, there. So this is the other board they're looking at as well. The Pico Wireless, which is a combination, believe it or not, which is really... <laughs> 
fascinating to me is they've combined the um, the it's like a daughter board for the Pico, but with wireless. And so they combined it with the ESP32, and I think we're going to see a board that combines that as well, rather than this um, two-part solution. I just find that fascinating that they're combining this new microcontroller with the ESP33. Uh, I think in a few years' time, you could see Expressive and Raspberry Pi um, head-to-head, I think, quite possibly. They're the two big new microcontroller players, in my opinion. Um, so anyhow, I thought I'd show you that one, because that was quite interesting. So they're doing it. Now, the other people, um, obvious ones, are Adafruit, as well as obviously saying that selling the uh, Pico, guess what else they've got? There we go. They've got the Adafruit Itsy Bitsy RP2040 coming soon. So that's like the same kind of pinout as the small count uh, boards, like a bit like the, um, is it the same pinout as a Tinsy? I forget, possibly. Same pinout as a Tinsy. Um, so they're doing a, a 20 RP2040 version of that. Um, they're doing, obviously selling the Raspberry Pi Pico itself, which is already out of stock, but they sold out. They're doing a feather board, surprise, surprise, based on the RP40. There we go. That's again coming soon. Um, and no doubt they will probably do some others. Um, so I think we're going to see quite a few people doing boards around this new ARM controller from Raspberry Pi. So it is a really interesting move, just looking at it from a, from a high level. Ah, Laurie sent me a link here. This looks interesting. Raspberry Pi Pico emulates retro computer. Yeah. Recently re released Raspberry Pi Pico community has already given us a glimpse of the power of this new board with some incredible projects. On launch day, Raspberry Pi Foundation shared the Raspberry Pi project on Twitter. Um, designed to emulate output micro BBC micro demo scene demos. To an external screen, the BBC Micro is a machine which influenced Raspberry Pi, which is what Ebden learned on. Yes, and I've seen some other good demos as well. Um, something good I saw earlier. Hold on. I don't know if I liked it. Hold on. Damn it, it's not in my like list. Um, one minute, if I go to. <sighs> okay. Um, who did this? Was it Luke? Let me. Mm. Oh, look, <laughs> this is funny. Greg's already picked up a design <laughs> based around the Pico, which is quite interesting, that Luke was working on. Um, is there a better picture? Oh, is it here? 
is the micro emulation for the BBC micro. Oh, I didn't see this. Microcontroller GPIOs. Look, he's looking how clean these are. Um, because we're going to dig down. To, here we go. Yeah, he talks about it here. Good morning. Feeling like bit banging some DVI from my new microcontroller. So this is a board that Luke's got, which is based around the Pico. Sorry, not the Pico. The RP um, twenty forty. But the extraordinary thing about this. You can see it here, actually. Look. From this microcontroller, he's driving two displays over DVI. Pretty damn incredible, right? So you can see what this thing is actually capable of. It's pretty astonishing. Funny that you put P mods on there as well. Very interesting. I had seen some of these tweets before from him, and I was wondering what he was talking about. But it was obviously just prior to doing this stuff. Or, and you know, being able to show this stuff. Pretty damn incredible, man. Now, um, how on earth does that happen? Well, it's because they have built into this microcontroller this special PIO support. Now, what they're doing here isn't new. I've seen this on... Um, attempted on several devices um, I was trying to think of the devices earlier where I'd seen this sort of thing happening I was trying to remember whether the propeller did it I think propeller might have had some of this stuff um, Texas Instruments have a the processor that's used in the Beagle board has something very similar let me just see if I can remember what it's called hold on Beagle board. Uh, trying to remember what they were called. Just talking it from the Linux point of view here. Uh, no, that's not the one. Hold on. No, no, I'm barking up the wrong tree here, damn it. Can't remember what it's called. Bigger board. Um CPIO tape machines. Uh, it keeps going back to this. Mm -hmm. 
I'm wondering, did Beagle Bone change their chips, maybe? Okay, I'll have to go back. It was a feature of the Texas Instruments chips that they were using. Damn if I can remember what it's called. Damn it, I can't find it. I may have to come back. It's not hugely important. Um, was it PRI, PRO? Mm. PIU subsystem. So the PIU subsystem on the AM35XX or whatever it's called had Programmable real-time unit subsystem, which was connected to the I.O. Um, so this enabled you to control the GPIOs independently of the processor. So it had some low-level instructions that enabled you to do this. Um, doo -doo, hold on. Yeah, you can see the functional diagram here. 32 GPO out or GPI in. Uh, very similar actually to what Raspberry um, Pi is using in, in, in terms of the numbers. They've got some register units and execution units and instruction RAMs as well um, as constant tables, etc. Uh, but these are a bit bigger. So they had like 4K or 1K of instructions, specialist I.O. instructions for the GPIOs. So they could run these independently of the actual processor system. As I said, you've seen this before yeah, from other vendors. Um, I personally haven't done a lot of work with these ones. Look, you can see their simple instructions here. Um, basically, you, you can send GPIO instructions to them. Um, it's like a small instruction set. So um, the ones I've worked on before, was, was which was slightly different, which was a more integrated system. Um, but I'll come back round to that again later. So let me open up. Let's go to the... Uh, Raspberry Pi and show you what they've done because it's really quite smart. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Where's the link to on here? They started no. Oh, there was, yeah, I nearly forgot. The other people that have taken on this ARM chip are Arduino, and they've designed a nano board called the RP2040 Connect, which has Wi-Fi on it as well, or wireless on it. Um, oh, I didn't realise this. SparkFun, surprise, surprise, have done a board as well. So this thing's really out there. 
And of course, they've done a micro mod based on it. Um, where's the documentation for this? I had it open earlier. Let me open the data sheet. It's very interesting, actually, when you open this. Um, learn, talk about, learn. Mm -hmm. Software, hardware. Documentation. Yeah, configuration, Raspberry Pi, hardware. Pico. Getting started, board, getting started, specifications. We've done that. That's quite a nice page. Download design files, no. Data sheet. There we go. Sorry. Should have been more prepared. I did have this open in the other browser, but I restarted my machine. So let's have a look at the cool stuff, right? Let's have a look at the PIO. This is really interesting. It's a good shot too. Uh, the first thing you notice when going through this is they've really thought about this data sheet. This is not like your normal microcontroller data sheet. Because that's because I opened the wrong file. <laughs> that's such an idiot. That's the, that is the Pico. I don't want that. I want the microcontroller data sheet. But look, uh, same applies. It's really good what they've done here because this is very, you wouldn't believe this was a microcontroller data sheet. I mean, believe you me, they're coming for USTM microchip. These guys have really done something interesting here um, the way it's written is really good it's very very user friendly even the way they've done the diagrams is quite nice so here you can see the internals um, this not doesn't really show much at this point um, let's get into the deep dirt look at the way they've done the diagram for the chip that is so user friendly compared to what you normally see from these um, microcontroller vendors. I mean, really, they've made such a big effort with this. Um, yeah, pinout charts. Let's let's jump to um, fact. They've got really good code examples all the way through as well, which is really nice. This is so much nicer than you'd find in a normal one. Let me just scroll through. Let me just jump straight to the PIOs because otherwise we'll be here forever. Because this is quite an interesting bit. Now, one of the things where uh, FPGAs have been finding some good usage is in taking offloading uh work from microcontrollers for example i talk about this a lot they all obviously thought about this and they thought about that trend so here's an overview of the pio blocks how they're organizing very interesting so they have a bunch of um, first in, first out mem um, um, buffers, FIFOs. Okay. Um, and I think what you're seeing in this picture is duplicated. So that's doubled on each side of the chip, if I remember rightly. And you've got four state machines here, which can control the GPIOs. And you can have up to 32 uh, instructions, like miniature. It's like a 
they're like nano instructions rather than microcode it's more like a nano code it's a very small subset and we'll, we'll, we'll see some of those in a minute <laughs> Laurie's quite funny here so are you replacing the STM32 with this on your board well the answer is no I'm not um, although I won't rule it out in the future um, good luck in getting hold of any of these chips um, Ebden's or already seems to be suggesting that they're not sure that they can get them made enough to supply the demand that they already have for other people let alone for their own board sales so yeah they're going to go through a long curve with this I mean possibly it might be good to combine this with an FPGA I can see some areas where that might be very um, interesting maybe we can come back around to that at the end so anyhow just going back to what they've got in here um, this arrangement is very interesting so what they're aiming at here is so they want to be able to offload um, you know relatively simple protocol IO protocols so that that isn't running so rather than having individual peripherals this is the common way where it's done um, if you look at most of the ARM vendors so when you buy you know an STM32 I don't know F401 or something then you're going to get x number of peripherals built into that and x number of pins connected you don't always have a mux they tend to be on specific pins if you look at some of the other vendors what they do is they give you a mux so that you can mux more or less anything or anything but these peripherals that are built in are very um very specific so you'll have you know a uart peripheral or several uart peripherals you will have an I squared peripheral or several I squared peripherals. You will have SPI peripheral or several SPI peripherals, etc., etc., etc. But each one of these sets of peripherals is dedicated to very specific protocols. You do get some family type peripherals that are designed to be able to handle maybe some combination of serial. Um, this was popular on the AVRs, for example, where you have one peripheral that could do various different variants of, of SPI and um, shift, serial shift parts, etc. Um, so, although the Raspberry, the RP2040 has some dedicated SPI, I squared C, and UARTs you have these more general purpose PIO um, driven state machines now the state machines enable you to do things that they're listing here for example so you can create a parallel bus I2C or a free pin I2S STIO SPI DSP QSP I UART or as they say at the bottom here which is very interesting to us so what were we just seeing Luke do uh, DPI or VGA so doing video out um, and doing that is very impressive because you need very quick turnarounds okay so they're using these very small state machines and small buffers FIFOs that are used to interface between the main cores, if you like, uh, either via direct access or via DMA um, to, to these FIFOs. The FIFOs then talk to these state machines. These state machines then control the flow of information to the GPIO ports or the other way around from the GPIO ports to the FIFOs, including all the shifting in between. Clever arrangement of shift registers um the pio is programmable in the same sense as a processor it says here uh, there are two pio blocks with four state machines each that can independently execute sequential programs to manipulate the gpios and transfer data unlike general purpose processor pio state machines are highly specialized io with a focus on determinism 
precise timing and close integration with fixed function hardware. Each state machine is equipped with two 32-bit shift registers, either direction, any shift count, two 32-bit scratch registers. Um, those can be used, if you like, as state variables. Um, four times 32-bit bus FIFO in each direction. You have a TX and an RX, or it's duplex. Reconfigurable as 8 by 32 in a single direction. I think you can join them together as well, to a degree. There is also a fractional clock divider which is good so if you want specific like UART rates you can use you can divide the clock coming into these state machines uh, they've got flexible GPIO uh, mapping so it's just MUX based so you can you know mix these state machines with various different GPIOs there's a DMA interface uh, sustained throughput with one word per clock from the system's DMA so it's fast and you have IOQ flag set and clear status, which can be set in, from within inside these state machines. Um, and each of the state machines along with its supporting hardware occupies approximately the same silicon area, they're saying here, as a standard serial interface block, such as an SPI or an I2C controller. However, you've got something here that can be reconfigured for that same space. So in the, the, this, this is where the similarity of your normal microcontroller ends and the RP2040 uh, begins. Now, this isn't new. As I've mentioned before, you've got the PRU thing from the likes of Texas Instruments. I know Propeller had some other bits as well. Uh, the stuff that I've worked on in the past was based around XMOS. However, that works at a slightly different level. It's a much more integrated way of doing things and I, I will cycle back around to that because that's important um, that works slightly differently at a higher level from a programming point of view so um, here you can see the the diagram of what those what it, what's it inside one of those state each of those state machines so you have an out shift or an in shift connected to the FIFOs the TX and RX FIFOs you have a scratch X and a scratch Y. These are two 32-bit registers to hold state, effectively. Um, you have a program counter, um, and you have the clock division user, the fractional clock divider, plus some control logic and flags, etc. Um, and then you've got the IRQs coming back out as well. So what you can do is you can write using a primitive set, like this nano code, if you like, um, set of instructions. So here the example that they give is just creating a square wave. This would be like a really fast blinking because it would be super fast because of the clock rate. And again, this looks just like assembly. For those of you that have done assembly, this is the format that you're likely to write this in. Um, and that gets compiled by a tool, tool that comes in the SDK, which creates a binary file in the form of a C header file. Um, and then you can load it in your C as part of the SDK. So here we see um, a start point label. That's, that's the start point of the program effectively. Set pin DIRs one. So we're setting the pin direction here um, to output in this case. Uh, you then got another label, uh, which is called again, which is like a loop point label here. Um, so first of all, we're going to set pins high to one. And then this other thing here is basically a delay. Number of clock cycles to wait before moving on to the next instruction. So this is saying make the pin high, wait one clock cycle. Then it goes to the next instruction, which is set the pin to zero. Doesn't wait for another instruction. And then it says jump again. So it actually jumps back to here. Really simple stuff. But it's, this is assembly, basically. And you're using an assembler-like thing. But you've got a very, very small subset of instructions in this case to what you'd normally find if you're doing assembly instruction for a um, microcontroller or a microprocessor. Um, the tool that they use is called, um, I don't know if it's POASM or PIOASM, but it's P-I-O-A-S-M. OK. 
Okay. Uh, the next sample here shows some uh, talk about control flow. Uh, they're just talking through this, aren't they? What's the difference? Oh, so here they're showing you how you then load that program. So you run the piasm over this text file, if you like. It would then create another C header file that you include. And you can then run that quite simply in your C code in the SDK, just by basically copying the contents of that into the memory location for the instruction store for that state machine. So it's very, very simple. So it just goes through all of the instructions and it copies them into the instruction memory here. Um, then you can also set the clock division ratio, the speed at which you want the instructions to iterate through. Again, that might be useful for different UART speeds or something. And then you can set things like which, which, which GPIOs is this affecting, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Here it shows you the detail of how they're dealing with the shifting the information in from the program, uh, from a DMA, for example, or whatever. Um, there's all sorts of trickery here that enable you to make very small programs based on certain assumptions in terms of um, the way that you configured things. But let me just show you some of the uh, instructions here. That's the assembler they're talking about. But if you look at the instructions, there should be a table here. So here's the um, how simple the instructions are. You've got a jump instruction, a wait instruction, uh, in and out, and then you've got all of these operands that come for the different instructions here. So on the jump, you've obviously got a condition, you know, like jump on none zero or zero, um, where you're going to jump to. Um, the included delay or a side set which we can talk about um it's got a wait instruction and then the other ones are things like push and pull so when you issue the push instruction you're actually pulling off uh, sorry push instruction you're pushing to the uh rx fifo and then the pull is pulling from the tx fifo um You've also got a move, which is quite useful. What was the move useful for? Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head. I think it's moving the state from one GPIO to the other, for example, or moving it into a register, possibly. Um, IRQ controls and setting of registers. So it's a tiny instruction set. Very small. Um, so this whole thing is very interesting in that what it enables you to do um, is not just assemble a program that then controls those GPIO pins to handle say a protocol. Maybe say you were going to do talk to you know one of their WS. Um, LEDs, this example here talks about that. Let me just go back. Yeah, so talking about a WS812 LED driver is a good example here. It's very simple. So once you got that protocol, well, that's just a library call, right? But not only that, you can change things dynamically. So you can write to the instruction store and change the instructions as you're going along or pass in parameters to that FIFO mixed with your data so that it can operate on those parameters or change what it's doing dynamically. So for more complex, you know, if you have a much more complex protocol with changes in the state sequences, then you can dynamically control those from your C code as well. So that, I think it's, it's very, very, powerful um, system now as I said before other people have gone down this kind of route 
but normally it's resulted in a very small or narrow community and it's not really taken off outside however this is raspberry pi organization that we're talking about here they have a massive community um, and it's quite well structured in the way that things get broken down now not everybody is going to be going in there and writing you know the PIO code it will be a relatively small number of people in that community that do this to handle all of the different protocols you can think of and all the hard bits that other people can't do and a lot of this stuff will just end up being included in the libraries and the SDKs but there will be a high usage because of the size of the community and a higher desire for people to get involved and come in and solve those problems so there's a good chance that this could succeed so from that point of view it's very interesting and they certainly are doing something that is different here um, I won't say it's the first time anyone's done this because as I've pointed out before other folks have tried um, and many of them I wouldn't say failed but have been slightly less successful <laughs> you know this hasn't been a generic thing if you look at what's out there in the microcontroller world very few of them have been brave enough to go down this route um, because it's gotten very little traction in the past so but it's very very interesting and I'm fascinated by this because this is one of the things that I'm I've worked on in the past and stuff is how to build in distributed uh, processing into a real-time systems in particular it's a very useful thing to be able to do because it enables you to solve a whole bunch of problems however I'd say that the way that Raspberry Pi has come in to solve this problem they've done it certainly at a functional level from a hardware point of view it looks pretty good from the software point of view I think it's lacking slightly um, they could change that to a degree moving forward. I don't know how much they built in that enables them to take this further. So the way that you're doing this is pretty good, better than a lot of people have done in the past, a lot of other companies. But it it's not it's not what I'd call um A kind of um, uh, the abstractions used here are different from the abstractions used on the cores, and there is an impedance mismatch here, and they haven't taken the kind of bigger view how to solve that let me put it this way um, I'm not sure if you're aware but I, I one of the things that I did a lot of commercial work on as well as some open source work on before was with uh, organizations like um, Exmos for those of you who don't know Exmos are they're another UK chip company um they build multi-core microcontrollers and have been doing it for years um but they the way that they design their hardware is to move a lot of the load into software um but their microcontrollers were running at much higher speed than the other microcontrollers out there because they were concurrent there were layers of concurrency in there but they took um, a more 
global abstraction all the way down. In fact, um, unsurprisingly, the company was started by a student of David May and David May. And David May, if you know your compute history, um, was the guy that designed the transputer um, and uh, things like Occam. Now, his view on the way that you did concurrency, um, and particularly real-time concurrency, um, was using um, what's called um, CSP. Um, it's not concurrency sequential processing. It's, um, oh, I always get this wrong. Communicating sequential processes. That's what it stands for. And it's a mathematically safe way of doing concurrency. Um, it stops you making all the silly mistakes that you make if you just try to write C on um, using you know standard C's and threads and things like that you you hit all of the big issues around race conditions etc and that kind of thing um, by using CSP you, you can avoid a lot of that um, and CSP was developed I think in is it the 70s or 80s by Hoare um, who was was he at Cambridge I can't remember computer science genius um came up with this and mathematically proved the idea of um csp so the work that um they've made it was translating that into um ocam which was the language that was used to program the transputers but this was a double-edged sword on one hand it's what made the transputer fail because nobody knew how to program in Occam and everyone was doing, wanted to do things in C, um, despite the power that Occam provided. The um, other implementation you may have heard of that's more modern is a thing called Go from Google, um, written by Pike. Now, Rob Pike has been involved in a number of languages before Go, uh, many of which had CSP at their heart. Um, one quite interesting one was um, a lot of people don't know about was um, this one. Um, Limbo it was another piece of work that Pike was um, involved with. Uh, and this ran on Plan 9 and Inferno, um, strangely enough. And if you want to know about that stuff, do talk to Robert Miller on our on our forums because he was instrumental as well in writing a lot of code and still writes code for for those platforms. It's a very interesting platform, but again, based on uh, CSP principles in many ways. But Go is probably the most recent language to use um, CSP as its construct and abstractions. <sighs> Laurie's just uh, telling me I attended a talk on CSP by Tony Hoare a long time ago I still have his book cool I'd never seen him speak I mean I know David and I, I know his son uh, Jonathan who I spent some time working with as well um, when he was at Exmos but um, I'd never actually seen Tony talk that must have been quite cool I mean, it is quite brilliant, the, the whole CSP thing, in my opinion. Very underrated. But anyhow, so Exmos um, later um, applied some of the similar things they got learnt, that David had learnt from um, the transputer uh, and the Exmos microcontrollers um, were concurrent microcontrollers. And in these you didn't really have peripherals in the normal sense you had these very small um, sets of features on the IO that could be programmed using concurrency inside the main um, main cores 
And the calls were effectively virtual because they were round robin at a very high speed. But all of the state was kept separately for the different calls. So it was very fast at switching. Um, the it, it had a, like a 10 nanosecond resolution on the GPIOs as well. So you could write very deterministic programs. Now, in order to write it, yes, you could write it in assembly. And I did have to do some assembly. Um, particularly in the earlier days, because not all the language features were there at a higher level um, to do some of the more clever stuff. Um, what Xmos did was they um, developed a language called XC. Now, XC originally was a little bit limited. Um, it, it was like C, but it didn't have pointers, for example, to begin with, um, to prevent issues with uh, concurrency and stuff but it was a C it looked just like C um, however it inherited some CSP functionality that was added on to C um, I'm just going to slow down for a sec here because I've just noticed my frame rate drop let me just wait for it to come back up before I continue otherwise you'll miss this Oh, we're back up. Good. So, yeah, I just paused myself there because I didn't want to lose the um, my audience. You guys. So, um, where was I? So, XC was a language that introduced, um, as well as the normal C functions, um, it introduced the concurrency part. Um, in fact, it used something called a select, which was a key part um, in OCAM. It was alt, and this is a, like a decision tree. It's a bit. It looks very much like a switch in C, where you have switch and then you have a bunch of cases. And in switch, you pass in your integer parameter, which determines which case it's going to jump to. It builds a jump table, right? Now, in the select in XC didn't have any parameter that you passed in. That decided where it jumped to it basically uh, was like a wait instruction waiting for a hardware event so within your cases you could have a bunch of things like when a timer meets a certain number decrement or incremented to when a gpio becomes a certain state or a combination of gpios are at a certain state or configuration um, plus a default etc or because it had an internal communication engine when there was something coming in communication wise from one of the other processors um, so the you had this fork join concurrency um, that could be done at real time you know 10 nanosecond resolution basically moving through programs so rather than programming using interrupts and it did have interrupts as well by the way but you didn't really use it as much because they were structurally very difficult to use compared to using uh, this CSP low level event process in the hardware and it was very responsive so you actually rather than having peripherals in the chip you didn't do that all your peripherals were software so if you wanted a UART there was a library and you could use the UART or you could create your own same for SPI, same for anything else that you wrote. And it's because it was fast, it could do this. And it was a pleasure to write concurrent real-time programs on this. So much easier than an interrupter. And I built, you know, a number of commercial projects uh, based on this that were um, so much better and so much easier to build tests and, you know, um, not guarantee, but um, prove than the normal interrupt driven programs where latencies and overlaying priorities and that kind of thing cause havoc. Um, 
So they took a very top level approach and later on they brought in the rest of the C function. So you had pointers and things as well, but they had structured pointers that prevented you getting yourself in these race conditions and stuff. It's all very clever, very smart. I love programming in, um, in XC. It was a joy to program in to solve real world problems, real time problems. So that's a slight difference between this and what Raspberry Pi are doing. So Raspberry Pi are just going with traditional C and then you've got this bespoke IO assembly language. So you need to have two hats in order to do this. And joining the two up, although the SDK makes it easier, you're still dealing with impedance mismatch in terms of abstractions and things. Um, so what I don't know is, are they looking at doing something at a higher level abstraction later that solves this issue? And it will be interesting to see on that front. It also is very interesting from the point of view of some other things um, that I'm working on as well and have been working on for a while. You just check my messages. Someone keeps sending me messages. I think it's my daughter. I might even get a cup of tea in a minute. That's good. So, um, I'm going to segue onto the test rig stuff in a minute. But before I segue into that, and the segue is, you know, adjoined to this. Um, is there anything particular? I mean, we may come back around to this anyhow. Is there anything particular on the um, uh, RP2040 or the Raspberry Pi Pico board or any of the boards out there that um, you want to make any points about or you want to ask me anything about for my limited knowledge? I mean, literally, I only found out about it yesterday. So, you know, late yesterday, like yesterday evening. So I haven't had much chance to look at all the details. Um, so if you've got anything that you want to do before I move on to the um, test route stuff. I mean, I will say I'm excited by this generally, by your thinking of your ideas. I think, as I say before, I think Raspberry Pi Org have a really good community. So they stand a chance of probably having success, some success here better than anyone that's done any of this stuff before. Um, and that could really change things. I think if I was a microcontroller manufacturer right now, just straighten my monitor up. Um, if I had any sense, I'd be looking very carefully at what they've done. Because, you know, raspberrypi.org could change the direction here of the industry. Um, if you think of the impact they've had on the embedded industry, I mean, we're not talking about them wiping the embedded industry out, because that's not what happens, but they have made a major influence and they do have a very large volume already. And if they can replicate that in the microcontroller world, then it will be very significant, I think. Do you think this will be used in commercial applications? It's a good question, Lori. Um, not initially, no, because it's very early. But, you know, a lot of people have said to me in the past, uh, certainly since when it came out, do you want me to open that? Oh, no. Yeah, are you making tea? I am streaming, but it's fine. I've told them that you might make me a tea. <laughs> so, um, I remember when people used to oh, and I, oh, Raspberry Pis aren't going to be used in industry, they're only toys, it's for education, blah, blah, blah. But believe you me, I, I go in and out of a lot of companies um, in this business, and pretty much everywhere I go, you will find Raspberry Pis on people's desks. You know, uh, 
sometimes the you know the older embedded engineers will be like oh no i don't really use this i just play with it but what you often find i mean i've, I've gone to companies who i thought have had very you know uh high uh um high uh and complex requirements and then when i peek under the hood i find out oh they've built the entire thing on a raspberry pi module and before that they built it on a raspberry pi so um the impact is already there for raspberry pi i mean the stuff's everywhere more so than arduino i think in industry um what they did with you know for the embedded linux if you like is um has been very influential in many ways now not many people are going to be shipping out products with raspberry pis in them but there's a lot of people shipping out products that have Raspberry Pi modules in them, believe you me. And a lot of projects that have started off on Raspberry Pis and ended up on other embedded Linux platforms as well. So, yeah, they, they definitely have an influence. If this thing is going to be successful in their community, it will automatically become successful, I think, in um, commercial organisations um not only because it's useful and people pick it up for that but the younger generation that have been brought up using things like raspberry pis will bring it into those companies themselves if it's not already there you know if if people learn you know maybe they started playing around with python and raspberry pi when they were younger and they're now in the engineering industries or or software industries they will be bringing this stuff into those places um and they won't have any preconceptions you know that you know maybe this is only for education they don't see it that way at all so uh i think the answer to that question is almost definitely assuming it's going to be successful in the first place of course oh my tea's coming this is good um I don't know how long that will take to infiltrate, you know, commercial organisations. But anyone already using Raspberry Pis, and there are lots of them out there, will probably take a peek. Guaranteed. Will they be doing this? Yes, probably. Now, the other thing that's going to make a difference is if this is successful, then Raspberry Pi isn't just going to be cranking out lots of these small pico boards they're going to be cranking out an incredible number of these arm controllers oh, thank you sweetheart they come in that's good i now have tea keep me going so um it will work its way into those uh companies anyhow and I don't know what the price of these chips are. I think they're going to be more than just competitive. I think they will be well priced, but because of the kind of uniqueness of what they offer, they will give some of the others a run for their money. Now, I do not expect everyone to be in the commercial businesses to be rewriting their stuff to work on this. That's not going to happen. But for new projects, they may start considering this. And then you've got the, all of the community thinking, oh, I can make something from this. And then all sorts of new commercial opportunities occurring as well. But I definitely I believe it's the right sort of way to go. I think it's very good. It, it enables us to elongate what, you know, the, the envelope of the microcontroller. You know, we've got this thing of winding up the speed right now. Um, and you can keep turning that, but the power rises. You know, we saw this in the general compute area. 
So there's a limit to what you can do there and how much of that power that you can use. Um, the Raspberry Pi here has gone a slightly different direction. They've gone wide rather than vertical. Both with their course, um, choice of, co of uh, cores, M0 here rather than, you know, M4 or F7. You know, they haven't gone like that. They've gone like that. And that's quite smart. I think the power envelope of this device will be interesting for what it can achieve. I think that will be an eye opener for many. Very, very interesting. Um, so what was I going to say on this? It'd be interesting to see how many people put this chip in their boards. At the moment, it's just development boards. But this chip could make a big difference in a whole bunch of applications. The only thing that I think it's really missing is wireless. But they could probably buy the IP in to add that. I mean, they could do it externally to start with, but yeah. I think also, um, I remember when I was reading through the Twitter um, comments about this yesterday, uh, someone said, oh, why have they put an arm in there? Why have they gone for an arm core? Why didn't they go risk 5 Well, first of all, they started this back in 2016. RISC V at that point wasn't wasn't known about in the same way it is now. Uh, it takes a long time to make a chip like this. Um, I also know that they're on the RISC V board, steering board. So, and I also know the, the people involved who are also based in Cambridge that are very close to these. And these people are interacting frequently. Um, there is even marriages between certain people. But um, I expect Raspberry Pi org to have risk 5 sooner or later. What I don't know is, are they going to do the kind of Linux end, do risk 5 up there first, and then maybe do risk 5 down at microcontroller later? Or are they going to bring it out on the microcontroller first? Um, if you're learning how to do chips, not that Ebden is new to this, because he's been in the industry a while. But if you're going to do a new chip, you do something simple first, then you do something slightly more complicated, and you kind of build it up. So in that way, you think, oh, maybe the next one they do will be a RISC V microcontroller rather than a RISC V superscalar running, you know, Linux. But they may want to bed in what they've got first for a period of time. Um, so maybe the next step is to do a higher end RISC V that's on the Linux side of things and then bring that down and do RISC V for my controller later. I don't know, but yeah, it won't surprise me when they bring out RISC V in some shape or form. Just not yet. It takes a long time to make silicon. You know, this is not easy stuff. Um, Laurie's asking, to what extent is this chip open source? Will they publish the HDL? I very much doubt it would be my um, guess. Um, I think it's unlikely. And you need more than the HDL to produce the chip anyhow. Uh, this is all about process secrets and stuff. If you look at making chips, there's a whole bunch of geometries and things and characteristics that are secret that are all under NDA by the fabrication house that you can't, you know, let out anyhow. That's the way that this industry works. HCL would be a start, possibly, yeah. Um, one thing I did think would be a fun project is to reproduce the PIO in, a, in 
uh, HCL or M margin. And I was thinking about maybe doing that and having to play around. I'm still thinking about that. Um, the reason for me thinking maybe is that I already have something else that's more, I won't say Xmos like, although I did work on something Xmos like um, with Jonathan a, a number of years ago. But um, I have slightly different ideas, let's say. But it would still be an interesting exercise, if nothing else. In fact, whilst I was reading the data sheet today, I couldn't help thinking, um, you know, as I was going through it, how I'd implement that in HDL. You just can't help yourself. Um, it would be easier if they published a HDL for it, uh, Laurie. I don't think they would. But you can you could easily work out what to do. It, it's really that these units, these PIO units and the state machines are so simple. It's really quite simple to do this it's, yeah, and just read through that data sheet everything you need to know is there um, the more difficult bit comes in how you control that and link it into whatever you're doing so i mean you could certainly take this and do something equivalent and hook it up to a risk 5 soft core that would not be difficult um, in fact it will be fairly trivial in my opinion to do this and it would be a very interesting thing to do. It would be, you'd learn a lot from doing this. Um, I'd be very interested in looking at that um, as a possible way forward. You could certainly you could re recreate instructor. I'm not sure whether there's a grey area here, whether they have anything um, tied down in terms of um i don't know if they've done any patents for this i don't know if they've done any trademarking you know you'd have to look at carefully at um at what you're doing there just in case you you know you don't want to be standing on um standing on their um IP in some way. But yeah, certainly for a bit of fun, it wouldn't hurt implementing something like that. Um, I'd also be very interested to know where they got some of their inspiration from. I'm sure they will have looked at some of the um, ones that I'm familiar with that are out there got some inspiration there's also some of it that's not yet implemented wouldn't surprise me if there's some dead silicon in there that's just not being used right now either because it doesn't quite do what they want it to or that they haven't quite worked out how they want to use that but it is very interesting so let me talk about, oh, wait a minute. There's supposed to be an open source organization, so publish everything. I don't know. Are they? I know they publish their designs, so all the schematics and that are published. I don't know if they've said anything about open sourcing the chip, though. Be a good question to ask, Epton. Very good question. Um, I'd be surprised if they open sourced it. I mean, there'd be a limit anyhow because of the fabrication secrets, etc. But um, with the Fab House, because they'd be under an NDA. But um, hmm. at least they're being very upfront on their data sheet. It's much better than the current Raspberry Pi and the stuff that you have to wade through. Um, that comes indirectly from Broadcom. That's awful. Um, yeah, so it's an improvement. Whether they go all the way or not is another question. 
Um, I'm going to move on then quickly because I know we haven't got much time now. We will probably return to this um, either because we want to do some HDL like it, which will be which is interesting in itself. You know, do a Risk Five version. That'd be kind of cool. That hooks up to VEX or something, or adds these instructions to VEX. Um, I mean, you don't need to change the core, you know, a VEX at all in order to support this. You've just got to add something to your bus that enables you to do the DMAing and register access, basically, on the bus. There's nothing in the PIOs that are tied to the cores that they've got. So you can add this onto a VEX risk very simply. Uh, and what they're doing in the C is very straightforward. You know, they're just using addresses, register addresses. They're just memory mapping uh, parts for writing either to the code storage space, which is 32 bit, 32 instructions for each, each of which is 16 bits. So it's like 32 times 16 instruction, which is a, from the state machine's point of view, it's read only, but it can be written to uh, write only if you like, from the core, but it just sits in the address map. And then the FIFOs themselves sit in the address map. There's a shifter or whatever um, that handles either direct additions into the FIFO or DMA transactions with the FIFO, single clock transactions. So it's infinitely possible. Um, let me talk about one of the things that I've been uh, designing for a while. So I want to take the ECP5 and um, a microcontroller. This is probably going to look a lot like the um, innards of a black stack. Uh, module, i.e. the processor module, the core module. So it, uh, basically ECP5 combined with a microcontroller. Probably in this case um, an F7 microcontroller that has USB, possibly two USBs would be nice. Um, it will have the same memory architecture as um as the amalgam board if you like the core board the but it will have a lot more ios on the microcontroller and a lot more adcs um it will be a larger uh, f7 chip bga chip because i need a lot more ios for this um and then the ECP5 uh, will have attached to it some DDR memory, probably the same. Once I get the driver working for the DDR2, then I, I use the same memory chips on this because I've got quite a few of them. Now, this device is designed for uh, test environments. Let me explain. A number of commercial pieces of work I've done in the past has been about doing things like proving um, that a system does what it wants, particularly in the medical industry um, or life sciences. It's very important that things do what you have um, technically uh, specified that they should do. Okay. And uh, your ultimate aim is to be able to prove that as much as possible. Or more importantly, to find when that isn't the case so that you can fix it, right? Or work around any issues. Um, in, in many cases, this can be very difficult. So let me give you an example. I have to be a bit careful about what I say because of NDAs and stuff. But for example, one of the um, projects I was working on uh, last year 
was basically the project um, that I was working on was a robotics project that actually operated on humans. Okay, so it, from from a kind of criticality point of view, this is one of the toughest uh, levels uh, outside of military type applications. And I don't work on military. I refuse to work on any military applications. But the you know. If you get it wrong in this sort of application, the costs are very high. So this is robotics in a medical environment um, that is interacting directly with humans. OK, so it's, it has very, very high restrictions and uh, quality controls, tests, etc, etc, etc. More than you can shake a stick at in terms of bureaucracy. Um, in, in, in the development, everything has to be documented. Everything has to be done in very, very specific ways, um, as well as complying to all sorts of different standards and et cetera, et cetera. Anyhow, this particular project involved uh, mechanical stuff, motors, um, brushless motors in this case, um, were the main actuators in but there were other actuators as well lots of sensors hardware sensors analog and digital lots of electronics most of the firmware was written in c um, and it was c that was running at the edge of its capabilities in many cases to get the functionality out of these it was a modular system there was a very high speed interconnect communication system and then on top of this you had a whole bunch of much more higher level software running on you know things like intel and amd um, that was controlling it in terms of things like voxels i.e three-dimensional movement planning and all sorts of very complex levels. So you've got this very, very structured, you've got very low level mechanical and electrical and electronic um, with multiple modular components that have a very fast interconnect, high reliability interconnect. Then you've got firmware primarily in C, again, conforming to very specific standards like MISER, et etc. And then above that, you have uh perhaps um code such as some python for example was common in this case and you had then interconnects into you know very high level processing on intel amd written in a number of other different languages mixtures of c c plus plus python etc so you've got a very big um onion here in different layers and lots of different layers of interaction now, having, having developed the product so that it actually did what they wanted it to do, they then have to prove that it's doing that. But more importantly, they need to be able to capture if that breaks because they're not going to keep things the same. They're going to want to change things as they go along meet new requirements solve bugs etc now if you change anything at a hardware level it's a bit of a nightmare the approval process that you're going to have to go through before this gets out into the real world um, on the real running systems likewise at the sea level again there's a whole um, layer of bureaucracy involved in getting out but perhaps slightly less and you can do it more frequently than at the hardware layer um, and then at the high level above it's probably easier again still but at each point you need to know you need to be able to prove that you haven't broken it you haven't introduced any new errors so as you can imagine the um, half of the issue with this is building the infrastructure so that you know that this is doing what it should so that when you change something 
you haven't introduced something new or broken something new, uh, broken something that exists. And you have to do that on multiple levels. Um, it's pretty difficult stuff. So they only introduce any changes that are grouped together once they're very, very sure that any new improvements or whatever or changes that they made don't break anything else and it improves the situation so it can be deployed without any side effects on the you know live running uh, um, systems that are out there doing the jobs um, and they will do that at very low intervals so they will put together all of these changes and roll them all at once but they're very very infrequent because they have to go through such a huge process to the audit process in order to get a new release out is ginormous so it will only happen every couple of years or so um, but in order to do that they have to have uh, a very complex um, what do you call it um, a complete integrated test environment that is run at all the different layers, testing for all the different possibilities, etc. So a lot of what we were working on at the time. So for example, the hardware that controlled the motors, basically microcontrollers, I won't name any names here, but microcontrollers. So we literally had specifically built boards that had these microcontrollers in it configured identically to those in the working system. And then we added around them combinations of FPGA and other microcontrollers to examine what those microcontrollers did in certain situations. Now, the hardware we've added on the outside is basically simulating what's happening in the real world. But of course, it's not in the real world. It's all on that board. So you have a board that emulates that one particular part module of the system. And there are lots of different modules of the system. But that part could emulate many of those different modules. So as you imagine, it's a very complicated device. But what you can do is you can prove that when you change something, that it still does what it should do, as well as finding issues with the existing system, i.e. it not doing what the specification said it should be doing. And some of these things are quite surprising. Um, so most of that is done at a high level, even though the firmware is running in C. Um, most of the testing would be arranged at the Python level so that you would write the proofs in Python. There was a domain specific language that was used to run on the simulated hardware as well as bits of C. But you also had to understand all of the firmware running on the device under test which was difficult for me because I was new to the team and I hadn't, I wasn't involved in writing the original firmware, although some of the other team were. Um, the team was made up of lots of different people, they had different specialisms. Um, I did a lot of the motor stuff, for example. So we were effectively writing um, at a Python level the testing regime to prove that this was doing what it ought so that we could then change either fixing the code or adding new code in and then see if any difference had occurred whether that had broken anything etc it was quite difficult because i had to understand all of the c firmware that i hadn't written it was nothing to do with me i hadn't worked on it like some of the others but uh, you just have to pick it up quickly this is what it's like when you do these kind of um, you know project contract type roles you've got to pick things up quickly so when we were doing that i was always a bit frustrated because they'd already gone down a route um and they had a continuous integration system so any changes you made and you submitted at the end of the day to this would then go and run on remote servers and the virtual hardware that you had for testing not virtual hardware the simulated hardware that you had testing the devices or was also attached to a bunch of servers remotely. So it could go and run all of these tests offline as well. So you'd always submit to these remote uh, systems that will run overnight in many cases. It would take 
as the test cases grew, the number of uh, tests that it was running uh, became very elongated and it, it, it could literally run overnight just to complete your test and you come back in the next day and find them. But in order to write these tests, they've made decisions about how these were written. So most of the test code will run on a combination of connected PCs to these test rigs, of which there were two debug chains, one for the device under test, one for the simulating hardware. There was also the high-speed communication interface, which had to be faked as well, which was also connected to the PC, so you had to deal with that. And there was also in the simulated hardware simulation type devices that were controlled by a domain specific language that was accessed from Python. And this domain specific language was nothing I'd ever seen before in my life, nor had anyone else there, quite frankly. Um, not only that, but the vendor that had designed the original firmware I decided halfway along that they weren't going to use the vendor's hardware abstraction layers because of reliability issues and being able to get them to change to meet their audit trails and audit requirements. They actually wrote their own how. Um, so you were kind of, you weren't in Kansas anymore. It was a very difficult kind of situation. And what I thought at the time was um, the way that the testing was controlled and written from within Python, the domain-specific language that we used was very, very difficult to use and was somewhat underpowered. You'd find yourself going down this cul-de-sac of using this language to do what you want, only to find out that it wouldn't work fast enough um, to basically um, operate your logic on the real-time system. This was a common problem. So much time was wasted going up and down these cul-de-sacs trying to solve these problems, which meant you then had to back up and rewrite without using the domain-specific language, using more conventional mechanisms and having to dive down into lower-level code, etc. Uh, at one point, they had to literally double the speed of their simulation hardware um, in order to be able to run the tests on it because of this, you know, the issues with things like this domain specific language. And at the time, I remember thinking, well, wouldn't it have been easier if, even though FPGAs were being used, and in fact, they were using um, some FPGAs that I'm familiar with, I won't mention the names, on the board, they weren't really using all the capabilities. So the tests weren't being written or taking advantage of HDL. Most of the job of the HDL was really just reducing the bandwidth of some of the signals. So that this domain specific uh, logic when presented with the signals could cope. So often the FPGA was used to actually slow stuff down. But it wasn't used primarily, it was a backstop. And I always thought this was a huge waste. All of the digital stuff should have gone through the FPGAs. So the test rig system that I'm thinking of could be designed based around something like an ESP5 combined with, a, say, an STM32 F7. And what that would do, i tell you what it would look like. It would look a bit like, let me show you, for those that haven't seen this. Um, when I say look a bit like, I don't mean physically look like because I'd use different connectivity but I remember when I first heard about this I thought wow this is quite similar to what I'm thinking only they're coming at it from a different angle and aiming at a slightly different uh, audience um, have you seen this Glasgow interface explorer so this is based, so this has uh, a USB chip, effectively. I think it's a Cypress one. Um, and it has a uh, ice. Yeah, you've got one order, Laurie. Yeah. Sorry, I disappeared. Yeah, right. Let me know if you've missed any bit that you want me to repeat. And this has a HX8 um, ice 40 FPGA. And it's designed to these big blue IDC sockets are 
basically eight pins each and a equal number of grounds are designed for um, inputting and outputting protocols. So this is designed to be able to do any protocol. So it's kind of, you could kind of think of it, if anyone remembers the bus pirate? Do you remember the bus pirate, Laurie? Have you heard of that? The bus pirate was a low cost microcontroller based test system that enable you to go in and poke away at SPI or I squared C or any fairly simple um, uh, serial type protocol, UR, etc. So this is like a grown up version of that based around an FPGA that can do all sorts of different protocols. It can do things like PS2, UR, SPI, I squared C, you name it. And there's a bunch of level shifters on it as well, which is kind of cool. I mean, go take a look. It's a brilliant product. It's open source. Uh, they're using NMIGEN to write all of the protocol stuff for it inside. And they're using async IO Python on the PC side as well to hook into it. And they have boilerplate library and stuff. It's a really cool project. So it's a bit like this in some ways. Uh, but obviously, um, where I'm coming from is a slightly different angle. Uh, my interest is building test beds, effectively, and simulations rather than just protocol analysis and that kind of hacky stuff. I used it a bit when I was developing I squared C on Black Eyes 2. Cool. Well, the bus pirate. That's good. So anyhow, it's a bit like that in this sense. But in, in, um, in this test rig design, what you have is, you yes, you have a microcontroller, probably something more powerful um rather than just a usb controller although what they've used there is actually programmable i think it's 8051 based or something um and then you have the esp5 which is a bit more powerful as well to have a lot more memory you know like the ddr2 memory and stuff as well which you need um and then basically um on top of that oh i want to see glasgow is a better version of bus pirate Analogic analog. Yeah, it will be. It'll be really good, Laurie. Definitely order one. Uh, it's on my wish list too. I haven't ordered mine yet. I really should. That I was actually going to build one uh, from the PCBs, but that's another story. The um, you keep disappearing. I'm sorry. I'll keep an eye out for when that happens. But under the test rig, um, what I wanted to do is have something slightly different. So yes, you could write the stuff in MMIGEN, but actually what I wanted was a more domain specific language within Python that had MMIGEN underneath it. Um, that was more oriented towards testing, if you like. So, um, that's different. The other thing is, rather than having to write your stuff on a PC, um, you'd be able to run MicroPython on the microcontroller as well. And you'd mix in some analog stuff. Damn it, I'm going up and down here. I just seen the. Um, hopefully, I should be back now. I don't know why this is so bad at the moment. If it carries on, I might have to. Um, Bring it to a close. It's just a welcome to the chat room again. That's good. Anyhow, so, um, yeah, so I am working on, I haven't even got a name for it. I've no idea what to call this, but this is a test rig thing. So I will use it for my own purposes so I can test my own projects with it. But I think others will be able to benefit from it as well, um, uh, which is interesting. So I'll talk more about that. But that... In order to do that, that involves, as I say, uh, domain specific uh, language, if you like, within Python to be able to express what you're testing. And that will also lean on some of the other stuff I've been working on in terms of building IO oriented distributed uh processing and that may well be csp based 
it's not guaranteed yet i'm playing around with that and how that works etc which is where that connection is with you know what we we're seeing earlier when i mentioned the xmos stuff when i mentioned you know what raspberry pi just announced with their pio stuff and the propeller stuff etc etc um that was a segue on that uh, given that I'm going up and down quite a lot, I'm probably going to look at finishing it now. Did you have any other questions, Laurie? I mean, that project probably is not your street quite as much. I don't know. It might be useful to you, but, it, you know, the Glasgow may be something more suitable. Um, Testing is a slightly different area. I mean, you could use it for hacking as well. Um, and what I write on here could actually run on Glasgow as well, potentially. Um, basically, what the board will be capable of doing is um, virtualizing hardware for a system under test, for example. What would the DSL look like? Ooh. Well, that's tricky. Um, at a low level, it will just look like a programming language. At a higher level, it will require um, certain, um, the ability to reason about things. Um, so it will be kind of quite logical in nature in some ways. Um, but it will have libraries that need to speak standards as well. Uh, yes, we will describe the hardware in DSL, but not at a very low level because that's very difficult. Um, and I don't want to just rewrite Verilog or VHDL or NMIGEN. It's at a much higher level than that. It's about reasoning how something works. And from a test point of view, somebody writing the test, you don't need to know all of the details underneath, but you need to be able to orchestrate them. So, for example, if you know that your device under test needs to um, or operates uh, SPI then of course this thing has to be able to talk SPI but you wouldn't be expected to write something that does SPI you'd already have that in the libraries okay and but you'd be orchestrating the um, the data exchange with that SPI and making sure that you are getting the right information or sending or it's reacting to the information you're sending it. So it's a higher level abstraction than the hardware. Um, think of it as plugging into all of the pieces of the hardware so that you can tell exactly what the hardware is doing. You can emulate what that hardware would have to be dealing with in the real world. But it's fast, more importantly. And the way that you express it is at a much higher level, much simpler level, without having to know particular details. So the only details that you may have trouble with are, are anything proprietary that isn't already specified by those common protocols, of which there will be quite a bit of it, but, that's, but you will be confined to concentrating on those parts and the orchestration of all of those parts. So it may use a margin underneath to create the implementation, but you wouldn't necessarily be writing in MyGen yourself. You'd be writing something at a higher level. Um, so somewhere between, uh, what do they call it? Somewhere between higher level synthesis and logic, I guess. Ooh. 
So how does this affect the types of connections the board has? Well, I haven't worked out exactly how to do those connections yet. That's actually pretty tricky. Um, the way you historically did uh, electronics test is via things like IDC cables. That was quite common. If you look at logic analyzers, etc., that was quite common to be able to do that. But there are two levels. There are one which are the proper integration levels, in which case you'd have the device under test. Um, and then you'd actually put your hardware as a module onto the same board directly. Uh, and that's quite common. That's probably the more common case. And then there's the other case of where you have this module actually on something that has a bunch of IDC connections and high speed connections as well, because it can do things that aren't just uh, lower bandwidth, it can do higher bandwidth. And then you use, you know, flying leads or IDCs to connect into your device under test. So there's two ways of doing it, depending on um, how close you need to be to it, and also what kind of budget you have for your testing regime or your development regime. Sometimes one way is fine. Sometimes you need to go further and integrate this in. Um, you could kind of, one way of looking at it is you could kind of think of it as integrating JTAG in, but except this isn't JTAG. You need to tack into a lot of the IOs of the system directly. So normally that involves taking your board and designing extra connections on there for being able to tap in. Or when you design the initial board, you design it to work with this module and you wire in. IDC is just a convenient way of doing it. Um, but it's also good, it will also be a good tool if you're manufacturing and you need a test rig because when you manufacture, you need to design a test rig. This will be really good for um, building test rigs. Lots of people use things like Raspberry Pis and that to do that now, which are less than suitable in many cases, and they're certainly limited in their capabilities. So it's a kind of um, vertical application of what we've got in Amalgam. And initially it probably look a lot like Amalgam, but I, it does need some differences, that you, things that aren't on Amalgam. So for example, um, to get the proper mixed signal capabilities in, you need to uh, integrate the IOs in uh, in a different way um, there's a lot more connectivity involved but inside the test system itself is basically a bunch of if you like csp units that operate these um, protocols etc and it's very io bound a lot of it's about io um, hence the connection to the earlier conversation. Yeah, it's a bit difficult, it's a bit abstract um, at this level if you haven't kind of worked in those areas before. Uh, it will become more real. When I put start putting some hardware together and show it doing something, um, in order to really see its value, what I need to do is apply it to a particular, excuse me, a particular um, design that's ongoing. Um, either something I'm already designing or someone else's device or something like that to, and then, then you'll probably see uh, what it looks like. But the inside of it and the DSL 
will be interesting because it's applicable in areas other than test. It provides an interesting area for development. Uh, that board is general purpose to a degree. It will be a module just like Amalgam is. So you could integrate it into something else. You don't have to use it in uh, just as a test system. You could use it to do anything that Amalgam could do really. I mean, it could be the start of a kind of super amalgam, possibly. Um, but there's some features in there that you might not need, so you're, you might be paying a little more for. You're not actually paying much more for it, to be fair. Um, or not with the current design. It doesn't look much more expensive. Uh, what it doesn't have as much of is all of the other connectors that Amalgam has. Amalgam, don't forget, has a whole bunch of other stuff on it. Uh, this is very much more general purpose than that, you know. I think there's a lot of places this will go in, but they're more vertical type situations. And yes, you could use it like a Glasgow if you wanted to, or a bus pirate, because it'd be able to do that just as easily. Although it'd probably be a lot faster. Um, CCP5 based rather than ICE40 based. So it's, it, it, the I.O. capabilities would be, um, you know, a bit higher end. But Normally you're interfacing to, you know, microcontrollers under test. That kind of environment is what you're going into. Anyhow, any other questions, guys, before I uh, slope off for the evening? Um, I probably want to talk about the Raspberry PIO stuff again next week, maybe. I'll have a think about it. And if you have a think about it as well, Laurie, um, you know, doing a... HCL or Imogen version of those blocks will be interesting and fun, I think. Uh, so we can talk about that some more. Particularly if you can hook it up to the VEX risk, that'd be kind of cool. That'd be very cool indeed. I'd like to see that. And I might be able to help if you get unstuck at all. Because I do have some insight to some of that stuff. Not on the VEX risk side, but on the IO stuff. Okay, no more questions. Cool. Well, listen, it's been two and a half hours, actually slightly less because I started late, and apologies for that. So let's catch up again. Um, next week hopefully i should be able to do wednesday again apologies for not doing wednesday this week and having to do friday um we have to share a bit of bandwidth at the moment uh and wednesday turned out to be um parents evening my eldest is a teacher and she's having to do that from home and that wasn't where it was scheduled to be she was meant to be doing it before but their uh, school systems online systems crashed under the load <laughs> so they had to defer it and do it on Wednesday which meant I couldn't do my stream because if I tried to do this streaming at the same time she's doing all that video zooming to the parents and stuff it would have been um, uh, a bit of a carnage on the broadband so uh, I moved it to Friday hopefully um, next Wednesday we should be okay should be good to go back to the normal schedule anyhow Thanks for joining me, guys. Um, as usual, do join us down at um, the MyStorm forum. Um, 
for more conversations. Uh, and if I don't speak to you before then, I'll see you on Wednesday. Ciao.